All right, everybody, it's just after 10 a.m. So let's go ahead and get started with today's webinar, Gen Z Values and Job Search Practices. Um, before I get started, I'd like to just make sure folks can hear me out there. Uh, if you wouldn't mind giving me a hand raise or a thumbs up or a yes in the chat, I always appreciate that just so I make sure I'm not talking to nobody. Okay, awesome. I see folks raising their hands. Thank you so much for that. Let's go ahead and get started with today's presentation. For some quick logistics, first off, welcome to the webinar. If you have any issues, if you're not able to hear me, not able to see the slides, et cetera, feel free to use that chat feature in Zoom. I have that open on my screen. Um, for questions, which I'm happy to take throughout the presentation, and we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, I prefer the Q&A feature, but you're welcome to use the chat as well. I have both open and we'll be monitoring them throughout today's presentation. To introduce myself, my name is Dan Herb. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the Internship Success Manager here at the UW Career and Internship Center. I've been at UW for just over five years, and my main goal on campus is to provide students with a meaningful outside the classroom learning experiences like internships, jobs, et cetera. Uh, as a fun fact, I did my first internship when I was an undergrad at UC Santa Barbara with a grassroots political campaign. And I've also listed my contact information there, uh, email and phone. Feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is more general advice and tips. Um, if you want any sort of uh, specific help with your particular positions, whatever's going on in your organization, happy to provide that or provide other resources as well. And before we get started with today's content, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the university sits and to note that the Career and Internship Center acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land. The land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. So a moment to acknowledge our place before we get started with today's presentation. Okay. Here is our agenda for the next maybe 45, 60 minutes or so. We'll see how long things go. Um, we'll talk just first generally about uh, the student population at the University of Washington, just more going through facts and figures to give you a sense of who we have available in terms of students to recruit for your positions. Uh, second, we're gonna look at Generation Z and their sort of values, ideologies, uh, things that research shows us in terms of their general preferences and as they relate to the, the job and internship search. And then we'll close with thinking specifically about what you all can do as employers to help meet students where they're at and update your hiring practices to best fit the current generation of typically aged college students. So that's our plan for today. Again, I'll try to take questions throughout the presentation. And again, feel free to use that Q&A or the chat feature in Zoom. I'll be monitoring them throughout. I also want to note, because I always get this question, about whether we'll be sending any follow-up information. And the answer is yes. Uh, I am recording today's presentation, so you'll get a link to the session recording. I also will provide a copy of the slides which have the notes and many of the links and sources that I'll cite throughout. So don't feel like, feel free uh, to not necessarily take aggressive notes throughout. You'll be getting a copy of the slides probably tomorrow morning in a follow-up email from me. So with all of that in mind, let's get started with our first section, uh, looking at the student populations here at the University of Washington. And I apologize for some folks that this is a little bit of review or things you already know, but I want to make sure you all have a good grasp on this uh, as we talk about sort of student values. So the University of Washington is actually a three campus system here in the state of Washington. We have UW Seattle, which is what most folks think of, and that's where I'm located. We also have smaller campuses at UW Bothell and UW Tacoma. You can see the numbers there in terms of student populations. Uh, one important note for you as employers is that the Seattle and Bothell campuses share an instance of Handshake. So when you post something uh, to Handshake, which is our job and internship board platform, uh, both students at Seattle and UW Bothell will see that. If you want to reach out to Tacoma students, they're actually a separate school in the system. So you need to uh, select that as you're posting your opportunities. Um, but you can see UW Seattle, typically what folks think of when they think of the University of Washington system, much larger than the other two campuses, but do want to give a shout out to our, our uh, Bothell folks up north and Tacoma down south, uh, as they have wonderful students as well that might be great fits for your positions. Looking a little bit closer at that UW Seattle student population, which is what I'm gonna focus on for today's presentation. Uh, diving into that 48,000 enrollment, about 60% of those folks are Washington State residents, uh, roughly 16% international students, and then 24% are out of state students. So giving you a sense of where students are coming from as they come here to the UW. Uh, just over half of our students are identified as female, uh, which is pretty typical in large college campuses. Um, focusing more specifically on undergraduate students, which tends to be our focus here at the Career and Internship Center, um, about 
three quarters of that large enrollment number are undergrad students, so over 30,000 students, with an average age of 20.5. And I put the asterisk there because that sort of typically age college student, 18 to 22 years old in Generation Z, is who we're going to be talking about for today's presentation. That is not all students at the UW. It's not even all undergraduate students at the UW. We have non-traditional age students who are coming back for a degree or took a delay for whatever reason. But that's going to be our focus is sort of that typically age college undergraduate student here at the U. Um, some other things I want to provide in terms of the UW Seattle student population. Again, this is more for your edification and, and how we approach recruitment and other uh, aspects of, of this work um, is our, our uh, racial demographic data. And this is from the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity here on campus. Um, this is also looking at fall of 2020, so a year ago now. So this does change throughout the year. Typically, we benchmark to the fall quarter, which when enrollment is the highest. Um, but you can see the breakdowns here. I'm not going to read off the list of the chart, um, but just sort of looking at the racial breakdown of students at UW, sort of ordered by the number of folks that are there. The biggest thing I want to highlight in this chart is that um, oftentimes when uh, employers are looking to recruit students at the UW, they're looking to recruit a diverse population of students, um, or oftentimes that in higher ed, we define them as underrepresented minority populations. Um, that group includes folks that are um, in the Latino Hispanic group, Southeast Asian, African American, uh, and usually Hawaiian Pacific Islander and American Indian Alaska Native. So sort of the, the bottom half of the graph. Um, it's important to note that a little less than 25% of students at the UW fall into that categorization. Um, so as you're thinking about how can I reach out to more diverse populations of students at the University of Washington, understanding that they don't make up a huge big population of students here at the UW, which makes that work even more challenging as you're trying to figure out how to advertise your positions, communicate with these uh, populations of students in a really intentional and constructive way. Uh, some other stats to share about the UW campus community at large. Uh, we have 18 different schools and colleges, things like the College of Engineering, Foster School of Business, College of Arts and Sciences, et cetera. So lots of different places that students are studying in our over 180 academic majors. Uh, we have over a thousand registered student organizations, which is a great population of folks to tap into if you're looking to advertise your positions on campus. Uh, about one in five students live in on-campus student housing, so most students live sort of off-campus or not uh, um, in, our, in our campus provided housing. About one in five students, again, is a Pell-eligible student or sort of our indicator for a low-income student. Um, and 30%, almost 30%, are first-generation college students, the so first in their family um, to go to college uh, here at the EU. So again, giving you just a bigger picture of sort of who are the students that we're going to be talking about when we dive into the, their values, their perceptions, their approaches to the job and internship search, and a better sense of how you can approach that given who you are as an organization as you uh, implement your recruitment efforts here at the UW. And I want to just give a quick shout out to say thanks to the Office of the Registrar and the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity for making all these stats readily available. The links for all of these different statistics and more are in the notes, which again, you'll be getting in the PowerPoint slides from me in an email tomorrow morning. Okay, so that is our sort of really uh, a quick look at the student population here at the University of Washington, specifically focused on UW Seattle. Um, our next section is really diving in to those Generation Z's values, attitudes, perceptions, et cetera. And this mostly comes from a lot of awesome research uh, from folks that are, uh, that are doing this work out there in the world. So uh, before I dive into sort of Gen Z and getting in specifics of um, uh, their values, their interests, I want to pause and see if there are any questions about those uh, statistics from, from, uh, from the UDA population. And any questions, any thoughts on that before we move on to the next section? Okay, seeing no questions, uh, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Uh, I want to start off just by defining uh, who Gen Z is when we think about Generation Z, what does that mean? Um, actually, before we dive into that, sorry, I, I want to get your response. I, I'm going to add this slide in. Um, I'm curious what you all think uh, as audience members, when you think about Generation Z, our typically aged sort of college student population, um, who, what comes to mind? What are some of the, the, the attitudes or, or perceptions or interests or behaviors that you think about when you think about the sort of current age college student at UW? So I encourage you, thank you, uh, Jen, for kicking us off, but uh, type any thoughts in the chat uh, about things that are coming up. So I'm seeing motivated, creative, living in a purposeful life, social media focused, uh, which maybe could swing as a positive or a critique. You're definitely welcome to, to do both positive and also any sort of critical or, or or more constructive feedback. I'd love to see both uh, things that you all see. Technically savvy, yes, absolutely. Are, are one of the first generations who 
live, has never lived in a world without the internet. Uh, so definitely technically savvy comes up. What else, any other thoughts from folks about um, Generation Z is or what comes to mind for you all? Looking for constant feedback, yes. Career growth focused. Um, so not necessarily, not looking for company ladder climbers, but how, they, how can they sort of find positions that will help them grow outside of existing companies? Uh, yeah, yeah. Growing up in a very different world from folks before them, absolutely. Looking for work-life balance, great. Prefer to have a mentor and not a boss. That's interesting, we'll explore that a little bit, but yeah. Okay, this is great. Thank you all for participating. If any other thoughts folks have, feel free to throw them in there, but um, I appreciate uh, those who participated. So yeah, lots of different aspects of, of sort of Generation Z and things that come to mind, uh, things like technically savvy, a focus on social media, sort of uh, have a lot of expectations about what they want their work life to balance to be, what they want their work environment to be, how they want to be supervised, um, and how all that affects you as their employers, as their supervisors, as you're trying to recruit them into your positions. So yeah, this is great, a great place to start. I'll try to reference these notes uh, throughout the presentation as I uh, present the sort of research out there on what Generation Z is thinking and feeling. Um, before we dive into those specific details and, and all the research, I wanna sort of uh, provide a big caveat. I intentionally put the title of this slide in all caps um, because it really is a huge caveat, is that not all of UW undergraduate students are Generation Z, they're not this, this age, and not all of Generation Z is gonna think, feel, and act in the exact same way. Uh, the research that I'm presenting is based on survey data, it's based on uh, looking at behaviors, it's generalizations, it's the majority of you know, the people that responded to this survey feel this way. Um, so, this is not ever true for everybody. It's important to take your specific um, uh, situation into account. Uh, there's obviously going to be a lot of difference between the college students at a place like Seattle compared to a place like Austin, Texas, or Nashville, Tennessee, or Boston, uh, Massachusetts. So as you're thinking about the students you're interacting with, the, the industry that you're in, uh, what might make sense for you in terms of their values, their expectations, all of that. You really want to make sure you're contextualizing it um, and not just taking what's in this presentation as going to be true for everybody. And that's all. That's how it works. They really are generalizations. Um, it's also really true when you dig down into specific like racial and ethnic groups, uh, genders, uh, the gender spectrum, uh, different geographic regions, as I mentioned. Um, so just a huge caveat there um, that this is not going to be a one size fits all solution necessarily. Uh, it's important to take it within context. And also, if you're hearing different things from the students that you're working with, that they're not aligning with these this research or whatever else, take them at their word, right? That's that's who actually matters is what people really feel and think, not what the sort of survey data and research shows generally is true uh, for this population of folks. So just keep that caveat in mind as we really talk in mostly generalizations and overall research that may that hopefully will be helpful in most situations, but might need to be adapted in certain ones. Okay, so who is Generation Z? Uh, as I keep mentioning this, I want to just define it so we're all on the same page there. Um, I define Generation Z as folks born between 1997 and 2012. It's a lot of the research that I found that, that was their sort of definition. For some, it went as early as 1995 and even as late as uh, 2015. So uh, there's some range, uh, not, it's not a perfect answer <laughs> in terms of their age ranges there, but generally folks that were born in the 90s uh, are in, just getting into college, kind of just graduating from college. Uh, recently here and are, are typically age college student. Um, and as folks mentioned earlier, uh, Generation Z are digital natives, right? They've never really known a world where there wasn't the internet. Uh, they, they were born and the internet was accessible to everybody. Um, and as, as they've grown up, as they've gone through school, as they sort of created their self identities, the internet is a core piece of that. So um, the world is the, the most connected it's ever been, right? I can watch videos of whatever folks are happening across the world really easily on YouTube, on my phone, in my, in my room. That was not available to me when I was a college student even, uh, or to folks who are, who are older than this generation. Um, information, so the ability to, to Google things and look stuff up online and find multiple sources and, and do research, not necessarily having to go to a college or go to a library or how you access information. Uh, it's, it's always available for this generation and they're very confident and competent in, in looking up that information and finding more, finding more of it. Um, and ultimately, they, they lead 
lives that are both online through things like social media, like you all mentioned before, um, and how they interact with lots of people, and also in person. And it's been a little bit different this last year and a half with COVID restrictions and a lot of folks doing, you know, going to school, working from home. Um, but generally, this generation has sort of these parallel lives in this online universe and this in-person universe, and they intertwine and they interact. You might, you know, talk to your friends through this messenger app and then see them in person and reference the things you talked about online. And there's this just sort of uh, intertwining of those existences where I think for older generations, what happens online, what happens in person are very different and I keep those worlds separate. Uh, so sort of something to realize as well with this generation. So uh, I, this is sort of one uh, big thing when you read about Generation Z is they talk about the digital nativity of, of, this, of, this, and of this generation and thinking about how that affects everything about our, our work, and our supervision, our recruitment strategies, um, and we'll talk about that in later sections, but definitely a big aspect that defines this generation. Okay, so diving in a little bit more to the research about Gen Z values. Again, this is mostly from survey data from very smart people who are studying this and thinking about how it affects uh, our work lives um, and our, our ability to supervise and, and recruit these students. So these are the, the sort of top values uh, there's actually two slides of this, so there's gonna be six of them, um, that come up when we, when we survey Generation Z and ask them what, how they feel about the world um, and how they feel about uh, work life and other, other aspects of, of, of the questions that were asked. So I think the biggest thing that came up for them is that this generation is pragmatic and they're financially minded. I think folks kind of referenced that in their uh, in the slide earlier. So thinking about career fo growth focused, um, uh, growing up in a very different world, thinking about work-life balance. And what the research shows is that these values really come from two major events that have affected these folks' lives. Uh, the first is the 2008 financial crash and the ensuing recession. A lot of their parents lost their jobs and they saw the sort of uh, fear that can come from financial markets uh, going through a downturn and how that can affect people's lives. And they, they don't want that to happen to themselves because they saw it happen to their parents and their friends' parents, and they know that it was really difficult. So they're being pragmatic. They know that money is important to them. One of the biggest, um, when, when students are asked what they're looking for in jobs, uh, when they're applying for jobs after graduation, financial security is the number one thing that they're looking for. And a lot of that we think is because of you know, the sort of really life-changing event that they had given the financial crash in the mid 2000s. Um, more recently with the COVID pandemic, similarly, right, folks lost their jobs. So sort of a uh, lot of livelihoods were upended, figuring out how to make that work. So this sort of aspect of financial stability and not having to worry about, will I eventually, you know, could I lose my job or lose my house or have to move because of a financial reason is definitely top of mind uh, for our current age for college students. Um, another thing that came up in the research was that they are shrewd consumers. And what this means is that they're using that tech savviness that you all brought up in your comments, um, and also this sort of extensive network of people that they can interact with online to help them make decisions, right? In a practical sense, this is looking at Yelp reviews or you know, doing lots of research on products before they buy something because they can access that information and they, and they can figure out you know, who are they listening to, how are they getting their information when it comes to making decisions about purchasing consumer goods. But the same logic can be applied to how they apply for positions or like, what do they know about your company or your organization and its reputation or if you have you know there's websites out there of students who've reviewed internships actually handshake has a feature where you can provide a review of your experience interning for a particular company or organization students look for that information they want to have as much uh, uh, information as possible that they can get to before they make a decision about something. Um, and because they have it at their fingertips in their phones or online, it's easy for them to do that. Uh, so thinking about how can you make that information available to help students make decisions as a big aspect we'll talk about later in the presentation. Um, one of the articles I read about this uh, said Generation Z is sort of an undefined idea or undefined identity. Uh, they don't want to be boxed into these specific, actually it's ironic that we're doing a presentation about this and it's exactly what Generation Z does not like, uh, is sort of defining them in these sort of narrowly, uh, narrow ways or through generalization. Uh, so, you know, it's a little bit ironic that that's exactly what I'm trying to do in this presentation. It's exactly what Generation Z doesn't want. Um, but what it means for you is that they really think about their identity in lots of different ways, right? What are the different aspects? I'm not just a student at the UW, but I'm also a musician and I'm also, you know, from this particular town and what that means. I'm also religious in this way. I'm also, you know, all, whatever different aspects of, of a person's identity, but Generation Z is really thinking about all of them and they wanna make sure that you're including all of them when they show up at work, when they show up in the classroom. Okay, a few more uh, values as well. 
So diversity is really the norm for this generation. And, and we see this in demographic data, but also when you talk to Generation Z about their views on diversity. Um, current information shows that the shift in US demographics uh, for Generation Z, they're just barely a majority white um, in terms of racial diversity. So this is the most diverse racial generation we've had in the United States. So as they're going to school, as they're interacting with folks in this online community and seeing what's happening around the world, um, they just live in a diverse place, right? They see lots of people that are different than them, look different than them, and talk different than them. Um, that wasn't true, you know, 30, 40 years ago, where folks really lived in their, their towns and didn't travel outside much and saw lots of people who looked like them all the time and didn't have a lot of competing views or ideas right sort of in their face uh, on, on these different social media platforms or in classrooms or whatever else. So very big shift um, in, in sort of the long term, uh, but really true for Generation Z that they sort of expect diversity to just be the, the reality. And then I think when they're met with uh, non-diverse space or very homogenous spaces, it's uncomfortable for them. They don't really understand why it would be that way. Um, uh, similarly, we see, again, this is a big generalization, but most Generation Z are typically socially progressive. So they're paying attention to social issues, things like racial equity, uh, uh, LGBTQ issues, uh, voting rights, even you know, all those sorts of issues that are going on um, that are out there, gender uh, disparities as well. Um, they're socially progressive. They care about these things. They want to see positive progressive change in these arenas. And as they're looking to institutions and companies and universities and organizations, they want to see that you care about these things too. And we'll talk about that in later slides, but that's sort of a big in, in value for most of Generation Z is we see these issues, we want to make progress on them. How can I do that in the workplace? Um, another big aspect of Generation Z, and a lot of research out there that shows this, is that this generation is experiencing a lot of mental health challenges. Um, some folks have categorized them as the quote unquote loneliest generation, right? They have these so much interaction on, in social media and all these different ways that they can connect with people. But when it comes to you know, forming really uh, uh, impactful and meaningful relationships on a one on one or in person level, they have less of that. A lot of students just live through this, are living through this pandemic where they were had to be at home all the time and were doing everything virtually. Just it compounds that feeling of, of isolation and loneliness. Um, you can make an argument that other generations have also had this, but maybe we didn't categorize it in the same way. But we see this again and again in the research that uh, you know rates of, of mental health illness or mental health identification of issues for this generation are higher and higher than they've ever been. Um, we also see a lot of imposter syndrome. So just to quickly define that, basically it's feeling like you're not good enough to be doing the thing that you're already doing. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a really common issue for students in sort of all aspects of their life, whether it's academically, um, in jobs and internships. Uh, but, and the way that it translates in the sort of recruitment sense is that app, people who apply to positions are not necessarily confident where they decide, oh, I'm not good enough for that position, so I'm just not gonna apply. And they never even enter your applicant pool as an option for these different jobs and internships you're hoping to recruit for. Um, so sort of how can we you know, bolster that confidence or make sure that students identify themselves as qualified uh, is something we'll talk about later on in the slides. And then also contributing to these mental health challenges are just that the world has a lot going on and it's right in their face. It's, it's, on, you know, it's on the news, it's on their, their Twitter feeds, it's in, you know, it's in their inbox, talking about it in, in, the, uh, in the classroom, in, in our job sites. Uh, we have recessions and social and political strife and COVID and just all these things are happening and they're really difficult problems to take on and they're scary and they're sad. <laughs> um, and that contributes to, you know, how people interpret the world and, and how they can manage all that sort of external stress. Um, it's a lot to ask a uh, you know 18 year old who's trying to go to college to think about these things and have you know solutions or ideas or, or thoughts about it so definitely a, a big aspect of research out there and i encourage you to check out some of the articles i have linked if you're curious to know more about sort of the mental health challenges specifically but it's a big defining aspect of this particular generation of college students so given these sort of general values that I've talked about in these last couple of slides, how does that show up in the workplace specifically? So let's sort of translate from the general field more into the workplace, which is what we're talking about for today's presentation. So in the workplace, a big thing that I mentioned earlier and just demonstrating it here on the slide is that diversity is really important to our current of the age college students. Um, they sort of expect the world to be a diverse place. It's where they live. Why would it not be true at your company, at your organization, in, in my coworkers, et cetera? So as you're thinking about that, how it shows up in the workplace, asking questions like who's on our leadership team? So who is in charge of this company and organization? 
What do they look like? What backgrounds do they have? What identities do they represent? Um, who are the managers? Who are all the supervisors who are going to be working with these you know, uh, college students that are graduating in these jobs and internships? Um, how, what does that demographic look like? Um, it, even granularly down to the interview committees for these positions, but if you're hiring students in jobs and internships, who's interviewing them? Uh, how does that panel of folks, if it's a committee, represent your organization at large? Uh, and and what, what message are you sending your candidates? in terms of who is at your organization and how you are sort of celebrating and embracing diversity as an aspect of your work. So very important value to Generation Z. Um, they also don't necessarily expect everything to magically be perfect on day one, but they want you to be thinking about it and talking about it and demonstrating how you want to make progress if you are in a situation where you maybe don't have the most diverse uh, folks out there. And we'll talk about that again in later slides. Um, again, getting back to that pragmatic and financially minded, uh, value, salary, compensation, they matter a lot. Uh, this is the most important factor that students are considering when they're considering a job or staying in a job is, am I being paid enough? Am I financially secure? Am I stable? Um, that's the biggest concern for them. So again, sort of meeting students where they're at, making sure that you're able to provide that uh, to the best of your ability in terms of compensation for your, for your entry-level hiring, for your internships, um, that's really going to drive uh, student traffic, more so, and more so the reverse, right? If you're not providing uh, an appropriate salary or, or it's a, you know, unpaid internships, those kinds of things, students are gonna are gonna shy away from that because they they want to make sure they're financially secure. And then similarly, sort of combining these two things, almost um, focusing on like. Uh, pay transparency and equity is important, right? Students want to make sure that their or uh, Generation Z want to make sure that they're being paid equitably, and that not just them, but their their colleagues are, are having sort of this pay equity across across the board. Um, providing things like salary bans um, that makes Gen Z more likely to apply to position because they know what they're walking into, as opposed to things like you know salary will be you know commensurate with experience. What does that mean? I don't have a lot of experience. I'm just graduating college. Does that mean I'm going to be underpaid? Um, it, it generates a lot of questions and anxiety on the side of, of, of recent grads. Um, so commit, committing to equal pay was a huge factor uh, that students cared about. They're looking for that information on your websites, in your job description. Um, it was a big aspect uh, in the research that showed what students care about. So we'll dive in the next section here, we're going to dive into how to address all these issues. So the main thing with this slide is just sort of showing you the research and what Generation Z is thinking. Um, but I do want to take just a moment here, and this is sort of a reflection on your own. You don't have to share in the chat unless you'd like. Um, but what's one thing about this section that maybe was surprising, something you weren't expecting uh, when you're thinking about who Generation Z is and what are their values that, that show up? So just take sort of a, a moment here, uh, just reflect uh, really briefly. What, what, what was something that was counter to what you were expecting to see? as we went through that section on Gen Z values. And then that, this slide actually concludes our Gen Z value section. So I'll, again, I'll pause here as you're, as you're reflecting. Uh, thanks for sharing, Christy, uh, salary being the biggest motivating factor. Um, yeah, so that's a good point. So uh, thinking that uh, benefits or work-life balance would be important uh, for our currently typically aged college students. Um, yeah, it really is, uh, comes down to money a lot more. I think we're seeing that for, for our, our typically aged college students nowadays, they're really concerned about that salary bottom line. I would say my generation, I'm, I'm a millennial in my thirties. Um, we were we were more focused on the work-life balance. That's sort of uh, potentially a holdover from you know five, 10 years ago, the folks that were graduating. But I think with, with COVID, with the financial recession, we're seeing a lot more like, what's the bottom line in terms of dollars? Right. Yeah, that's a good point, Tom. Any other uh, thoughts or questions uh, about the values as and we get into, yep, um, as then we'll get into our next section here on sort of what, what we recommend doing about, about these different things. But any, any questions or thoughts? And I appreciate the, the conversation in the chat. It's really great. Okay, great. So we'll get into our section, which is more about the recommendations, probably what folks were excited for this presentation. So I really broke down the recommendations uh, that we kind of thought up of and, and what was in the, in the research into three different steps. So one of them is meeting students where they are, and I'll break these down more specifically on the next slides, um, living and showing your values, and then ultimately reflecting 
and adapting to the situation. So we'll walk through each of these, but just so you can have more of a framework for how to think about these things. So first uh, recommendation is to meet students where they are. And I broke this down into three different areas. Physically, although for some folks that might literally be physically, uh, but what I mean by this is how are you showing up where students are also showing up? So uh, things like attending or recruiting events, right? At, at career fairs, doing information sessions, networking nights, all the different ways that you can engage with students uh, at UW and other campuses. Um, are you showing up to them? Uh, and I, I should note also for the UW, these are all gonna be virtual for our fall uh, quarter here uh, in 2021. I have links to our, our employer calendar and create to register for these events. Um, for us, it's gonna be virtual for other campuses across the country, we've seen a mix. So it might be physically, it might actually be online. But the point is showing up where they are, but not just showing up, but thinking about how are you showing up at these events? Who is representing your organization? How are they representing themselves? Um, when you're providing information for students that might be interested in working with you, um, how are you providing that? Maybe formally you have things like handouts or, or you know, uh, position descriptions, whatever else, but also informally, right? Are your uh, representatives wearing a name tag with their pronouns? When they introduce themselves, are they sharing their pronouns? Um, you know, uh, all, all these different aspects of how we engage with students uh, in, in these events and sort of showing up where they are, but doing so in a way that reflects their values and shows them that you're thinking about the things that they care about. I think also thinking about what are your goals as you come to these events, and if you're coming to a career fair, being really clear with students about your goals. Are you hiring for jobs? Are you hiring for internships? Are you hiring for both? Do you not have any open positions and you're just there to, to network and get to know folks? Be upfront with students about, about that so that they know what they're getting into when they come talk to you, what, what's available to them, and sort of having that transparency around uh, what your goals are, what you're hoping to do, so that students can act appropriately and make that decision without sort of having a, an interaction where they thought something was going to happen or thought something was available, but it wasn't. So, sort of first thing to think about is, is these sort of quote unquote physical events. Typically, they've been physical with COVID, that's changed a little bit, but so that sort of physically, how are you engaging with students when you're able to have those sort of immediate interactions uh, uh, with them. The second way that you can meet students where, they're, where they are is digitally. So sort of thinking about the online world that again, students are, are our current typically age college students, very familiar with, very uh, savvy at navigating this digital space. Um, so how are you making yourselves available online as an organization? Uh, some ideas for how to do that at the UW, posting our opportunities to Handshake. I mentioned this earlier, but Handshake is in our job and internship board. That's where we send all students to go uh, for positions. Um, that's one great way to engage with those positions is to use our systems, but also other job boards, right? Not all students only use Handshake. You can definitely post elsewhere uh, uh, as well. Um, in those position descriptions that you're posting, are you linking to your website with more information or for being able to provide students with ways that they can uh, do that um, the sort of data mining they like to do, right? Finding more information about a position, about an organization, wanting that uh, uh, savviness of, of or the shrewd consumer decision making right they want they want that information they want to know more about you so they can ultimately make the best choice for whether or not to apply whether or not to accept an offer so make that available to them don't make them go and find it on their own um, as you're thinking about your online content and how you're making information available to students try to be as approachable as possible uh, we find that students and really everybody uh, engages better with video content or social through social media um, having contact us pages so they can actually email and talk to a real human instead of just dealing with robots all the time uh, those are the things we see from hearing from students about what they want from companies and organizations that they like to that they've liked to apply to that they're interested in um, so how can you package your content, package your information in a way that's gonna make uh, students more likely to, to listen to it, to hear it, to retain it, and therefore engage with your organization. And wherever possible, try to personalize the candidate experience as they're applying to your, your jobs and internships. Uh, we hear this time and again from students, they feel the, the candidate experience can often feel like you are you know, one number in this massive pool of folks. You never really hear back from everybody. You kind of submit your resume into a black hole and then it goes away forever. And it doesn't feel personalized. It doesn't feel communicable. It's sort of it's an unpleasant experience on the candidate side. On the flip side, the companies who do this well are the ones who send, you know, it doesn't have to be you know, an individual message that you're sending to each student, but you know, a mail merge where it has their name and has some other piece of information about from their application uh, in there. Um, those kinds of aspects make it feel like I'm being heard as a candidate. I matter in this pool. You know, they're interested in me. 
they'll let me know what's going on next. Even if I don't get the position, going through and having that information and, and being able to know what's happening behind the curtain is extremely helpful and makes it feel like you care about them as candidates. So having that personal action, taking the time to do that is really helpful. Uh, we also uh, would say don't shy away from virtual recruiting efforts. Um, this is stuff I talked about in the last slide, like coming to career fairs and other aspects, but um, there's actually research that shows uh, students of color, specifically black students, found virtual career fairs more approachable. So just to show you the graph here, this is research from Handshake, um, given that they used this plat a virtual platform for career fairs all of last year, and they surveyed students about their experience uh, on that platform. They wanted to know how, how, they, how it went. And one of the questions uh, that they asked was, virtual career fair events allow me to build more connections with potential employers than in person events. So sort of comparing and contrasting a virtual career fair to an in-person career fair. And what you can see with the, with the bars here, the green bars are people who agreed with that statement. And the ones that are over 50% are Hispanic and Latinx students and Black or African-American students. So students of color, those underrepresented minority students that a lot of employers are interested in recruiting. They're the ones that agreed most heavily with this and had very few disagrees with that statement. On the flip side, our white students were more, most likely to disagree with the statement uh, that the virtual career fairs were a better opportunity for them to build connections. So as you're thinking about your, your suite of recruiting opportunities that you're presenting to students, how you're gonna engage with students all across the country or wherever you do your recruitment, making sure that virtual is a part of that plan moving forward, right? For, for this fall, for this year, virtual might be sort of your only option. At the UW, it is right now, right? All of our fall events are, are virtual, so you'll have to do this. But maybe next year or down the line, how can I continue to use virtual recruiting opportunities to engage populations for which virtual might have been a better experience for them? Um, and that's important information for you all to know and think about. So it sort of falls under the category of engaging with students in this digital realm, but making sure that you're meeting them where they're at when it comes to what they're looking for, what they're hoping to see in your position descriptions and on your website about your company and organization. Okay, the last sort of meeting students where they, at, where, where they are is um, culturally. So thinking about how can I meet students where they are in a cultural sense? And the big question to ask here is how are you considering those Generation Z values we talked about earlier in this presentation when you do your recruitment efforts? Uh, so things like in introducing yourself uh, by using your pronouns or having name tags. Um, for folks who aren't familiar with this practice, uh, uh, people who identify as a gender non-binary or don't want to use gendered pronouns, like I, I at the beginning, I'm Dan, I use he, him pronouns. Um, normalizing that practice for folks who don't use gendered pronouns, who identify as they, them, or some other uh, set of pronouns, by having that be part of your practice, it shows you're thinking about that. It shows that students who maybe don't identify with their uh, sort of stereotypical gender pronouns uh, might be more welcome at your company and organization because it's something you care about. It's something you're, you're modeling as a behavior and then they, you're assuming that that value would flow through and how they'd be treated where they to come work for you in an internship or a job. Um, as, <clears throat> as they're looking at, at the position descriptions, the opportunities you're providing for, their, for them, speak to their concerns, right? We know that they're concerned about financial security, uh, that they're concerned about professional development, that sort of career growth that one of our audience members mentioned earlier. They wanna make a difference. They care about these social issues that are affecting people around the world. How is your organization, is your company, are the positions they're working in, how are they addressing this? You know, are uh, uh, salary bans available to them? Um, what are the potential career pathways within your organization to help that student or help that Gen Z uh, uh, entry-level worker grow and develop over time. Uh, including this information in the job descriptions, on your website, making it easy and accessible. Again, it's going to help Gen Z make that decision to apply to your positions. Um, making access to this information available online, we talked about this in the last <coughs> sense, but things like organizational charts with photos uh, of who is, in these uh, who is in these positions. Again, who the managers are, who the executive leadership team uh, is made up of. Those are things that students are looking at, they want to be able to find. If they can't find that information on your website, they're gonna assume it's because you're trying to hide it and they're gonna move on. So making that readily available, making sure you're sort of providing the access to information that they are used to having uh, in the world and, and talking about your values, things like diversity statements, uh, land acknowledgements, whatever, how, whatever makes sense for you and your organization that you wanna think about what's important to you and how it shows up in your workplace, make that available online, make it available to the students who are interested in working for you. And then ultimately just be genuine and honest 
and transparent about all this stuff, right? If your demographic diversity is not where you want it to be as an organization, don't hide that information from students, make it available, and then talk about how you're working towards improving it. Um, same thing goes for lots of other aspects of, of pay equity or uh, the issues we mentioned that students are thinking about. Um, they want to know that you care about these things and you're working towards it. It doesn't have to be perfect uh, on day one when a student starts. And they recognize that these are, things are going to take work and they're not going to happen overnight, um, but they don't want you to hide it. They don't want you to sort of sugarcoat what the experience is going to be like, because the last thing you want to do is have a, have a new employee walk into a specific situation, not have it be what they expect, because that's just going to result in resentment and then leaving rather quickly. Okay, so sort of meeting students where they are in a physical sense or how you're having interactions with them in real time, in a digital sense, what's online, and then in a cultural sense, how you are demonstrating the values that they care about in the work that you're doing and the information that you're providing. Another aspect of this, uh, sort of related to that cultural piece, is how you are living and showing your values as a company or organization. So Gen Z cares about this. They wanna know who you are as an organization, what you represent, what you're trying to do in the world. Um, so show them, make this information available. Um, if you have, you have diversity statements, put those on your websites, have salary bands or position or pay equity analysis of your company available on the website. Uh, what are the benefits information? Things like health and childcare for students who care about that, you have it on your website. Um, the demographic makeup, uh, you know, the work that I mentioned, the work that you're doing towards uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, those long-term career tra trajectories, sort of thinking about what are the pathways that students or our new employees can build up towards and, and work towards in the future. So showing sort of your values and, and having this available online is going to help students uh, make decisions about whether or not that's a good fit for what they want in a particular employer as they're applying for positions. And if you're asking yourself, but I don't have all these things as a company or organization, right? It'd be great to have these things, but we don't have them yet. That's okay. Uh, there's a bunch of resources out there, and I have a ton in this slide in particular. There's a bunch of links and, and resources in the notes uh, for how to do a lot of these things, right? If we don't have a diversity statement on our website, let's craft one, right? Who, who should I talk to? How can I make this a reality uh, for, for our company or organization? If you haven't done a pay equity analysis, do one. Uh, there's a great article about it from Payscale that I have linked here on how to do that. Um, how to assess your company culture. We have some resources on our diversity and inclusion toolkit for employers about different ways to sort of look inward and, and do assessments, do a demographic analysis, all that kind of stuff. Um, developing employee resource groups to think about how you're supporting one another in the workplace um, and thinking about those long-term career pathways. I think the, the comment that someone made earlier about that career growth over time that students are really interested in is absolutely right. And what they're looking for is what does that pathway look like, right? In the academic setting in university, we have majors, right? We have these sort of specific pathways that students can follow. And here's how you, you know, become a psychology major and get your degree in this thing. What's the equivalent sort of pathway that students can be following in the workplace uh, in terms of ways they can you know, get promoted and take on new responsibilities and grow as a professional. So if you haven't, if you don't have these things yet, we recommend putting in the work to figure some of them out. And it might not be your job in particular, right? This might be something else that happens in your organization uh, or, or someone else that, that's working towards it. But if you're really trying to uh, uh, attract these new, this new population of, of, of students to your internships, to your positions, these are the things that they're looking for. So the more information you can have in this space, the more you can show them that, that you're working towards these things, the more likely they're going to be able to identify, yes, that's a company, that's an organization I want to work for. Okay. <clears throat> Our last sort of recommendation here is, is with all of this work is to take a moment to reflect on what you've done and then ultimately adapt and make changes as you move forward. So all of this work that I've talked about, so uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, how you're adapting to meet the, the values of Gen Z, uh, the recruitment methods that you're doing, it's all ongoing. It's going to keep changing, right? If, if I had done this presentation two years ago, I probably wouldn't have talked very much at all about virtual recruiting because it really wasn't a thing in 2019. Now it's probably going to be a core element of most companies and organizations recruiting strategies forever. Um, so things change over time, different aspects of this work comes up. So how are you going to stay on top of that? How are you going to make sure that you are keeping up with current information, that you're changing practices and adapting to the needs of your, of your students that you're looking to recruit? Our recommendations is to seek out information, right? There's a ton of national associations and organizations that are doing the work. This is a lot of my sources for all the research that you saw today. 
Um, just to read off those acronyms, and again, I have links here in the, the notes slide, the notes of this slide that you'll get from me, but the National Association of Colleges and Employers, NACE, um, the, Cent or the Cooperative Education and Internships Association, uh, CEIA, the Mary Scott Resource Group does a ton of amazing work on researching internships. Uh, LinkedIn Learning has a bunch of different videos and modules that folks can use. Uh, your university partners, so talking with us here at the university, we're happy to help share, share information. Um, talking to the candidates in your applicant pools, right? Getting, yeah, do you have a feedback survey of, you know, how was your experience applying to a position at our organization? Even if they don't get hired, you know, getting feedback. Did you feel like you were communicated with frequently enough? Did you have any questions? Did you feel left out? Um, if you're not asking that, we encourage you to ask that. That's the best way to learn. And then you're like, oh, okay. Candidates felt like we didn't communicate enough. How can we update our practices to meet them where they're at? Um, ask your employees, right? As you hire these new folks or even, you know, employees that have been there for a while, what do they think? What are they looking for in companies and values? And then how are they making this work? Um, and asking your peer organizations, right? Folks who are similar to you in their industry, size, uh, employee makeup, what are they doing? What are sort of the best practices within your field, you could call it? Um, so taking the time to really reflect on these things, what is working, what is not working, if it's not working, how can we adapt? How can we innovate? Um, that's what's going to help you to stay on top of this stuff to make sure that you're really on the leading edge of, of where students are at and your recruitment practices and ultimately maximize your efforts, which at the end of the day, the goal is to recruit awesome students and recruit awesome recent grads into your positions. And that's really what, what all this is about. So another quick reflection exercise before we jump into the wrap up here. Um, but what is one thing given these ideas that I talked about on these previous slides, what's one thing that you plan to do differently or you'd like to do differently, um, given who Gen Z is, what they care about, and your current recruitment and retention practices? So again, sort of a self-reflection exercise, you're welcome to share in the chat if you'd like. What's sort of one thing you want to update given your current slate of recruitment activities? Okay, so while you're thinking on that, I'm just going to go through the wrap up. Uh, one thing I would like to do is just a quick poll of all of our attendees uh, to get your thoughts and feedback on this presentation. So I'm going to launch that poll. Um, please uh, select one of those different statements about sort of your takeaways from today's presentation. Um, this is just a quick summary of what we talked about. So the sort of started off with those student statistics of folks here at the UW. Uh, really looked into what Gen Z values, what they're thinking about, what they care about, and then what you can do as employers. For some additional resources, uh, we have a ton of information on our website. This is our employer channel, the different employer education workshops we have, in, have coming up. If you want more specific information on how to create internship programs, we have a whole website section on that. I'd also wanna make sure that I mention the other career centers here at the University of Washington, Seattle. We have a career center at engineering in the College of Engineering, and also a career center in our Foster School of Business. If you're looking to recruit engineering or business students, I highly encourage you to reach out to these folks. They do a lot of great events and other uh, outreach efforts to help you connect with their students. So really amazing resources on their websites as well. As a reminder, uh, I will be sending the slide deck and a link to today's uh, session recording in an email to everybody who registered for the presentation probably tomorrow morning. Uh, you're welcome to stick around for the Q&A. We still have oh, about 10 minutes or so, so lots of time for, for quite any questions. Um, if you have to disconnect, that's totally fine. Thank you all for coming and thank you for filling out uh, that quick poll as well. So I'll pause here for any questions. I also see some folks who have uh, added their thoughts in the chat about takeaways. So just to read those off, um, these are really great. Uh, diversity statement and social justice, uh, being more transparent about what we end up or, and we need to update our diversity statement, um, making virtual recruiting a staple of our recruitment processes and things folks are, are taking away. Um, but what, what questions do folks have? What, what's still lingering as, as something you are curious about or, or unclear about that I, we can talk about now? And as a reminder, you can use the uh, chat feature or the Q&A feature in Zoom to pose any questions. Yeah, good. so good question from Christopher. So do you think uh, these students have a big preference to work from home versus working in the office? Um, that question in particular was not in the research that I had found, um, mostly because at the time a lot of this was conducted, 
you kind of had to work from home, uh, given a lot of the virtual experiences. I would say anecdotally, talking with students who did virtual internships these last couple summers, uh, some aspects of it were really great, right? Uh, so I had students who were doing internships with companies not in the, the area they were living. That's awesome. It really expanded their opportunities. But a lot of the experience of like, how do I make connections with other people uh, that I'm working with? How do I you know, feel like I'm part of the team? Uh, even things like asking quick questions or you know, having concerns, all those things were way more difficult in a virtual environment and they didn't enjoy it. <laughs> um, so I, I would say it was a mix, right? There's not it also totally depends on the student too. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, working from home is great, interning from home is sucks. That's, that's an interesting way to take it. Um, but I would say many of our students really enjoy and thrive in in-person interactions. Uh, so having some aspect of, that, aspect of that can be important. At the same time, I think they see the value and flexibility of working from, from home for either whether it's a job or whether it's an internship. So it, I'm giving a wishy-washy answer because there's not a right answer to this, but it, it probably depends on your students uh, or, or your employees or your interns and what they would prefer. Being able to provide options is always ideal, but it makes it more complicated logistically for, for an organization. But it'll be interesting to see how that continues to evolve as we see a, a return to work, but then also companies and organizations allowing more work from home as well. Any other thoughts and questions that folks have? Seeing no questions, I'll plan to end the webinar here in a, a 30 seconds or so. If anything else comes up, you can pop that in the chat. Uh, as one last reminder, I will be sending the slides and a link to today's recording to everybody who registered. So keep an eye out in your inbox tomorrow morning. I'll likely get that email out to everybody. And otherwise, thank you all so much uh, for attending. I hope it was a helpful webinar. Be able to take something away from the conversation. If you do have other questions, you'd like some more individualized support, feel free to send me an email or follow up with our office. That's why we're here. This is for our employer partners in your recruitment efforts. So again, I'll, I'll leave the webinar open for just a few more seconds to see if anybody has questions, but otherwise we can end a little bit early and give you uh, seven minutes back on your calendars.